Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Studen. And first, I'd like to thank uh, Cairo Secure for having uh, me today and giving me the forum to share this information. And uh, again, I am deeply, deeply, deeply thankful. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most important topics that I think I've created, uncovered, reported on, perhaps in, um, God, maybe my whole career. And it's really about the best provider for pain. Now, I do want to share with you, and we're going to go to the slides. I do want to share with you that um, I want to acknowledge that chiropractic is not just about back pain. And if that's the sole purpose and focus of your practice, I really support that because we need everybody. However, chiropractic is so much more. And in my own career, and it's not what I believe, it's what I've witnessed. And I've witnessed systemic diseases, people get better, asthmatics breathe, um, high blood pressures go away, and on and on and on and on and on. And you practice how you choose and how you feel is best for your office, and, and we need all hands on deck. But I'm also keenly attuned into utilization. And I could tell you that for the doctors I consult for, that in the past 11 years, we've increased referrals or we've accounted for an additional 1,873,000 referrals into the chiropractic profession that weren't there before, purely based on similar information like this and the doctor's credentials. Now, I wanted to, or actually I uncovered something that's good for every chiropractor and it's easy. It's just easy. It's something we all learn in chiropractic colleges and we can do. And it's based upon the evidence in the literature. So there's nothing I'm going to share with you today that's not in the literature. Now, you're going to see QR codes. And by the way, it's called the Outcome Assessment of Physical Therapy and Chiropractic Spinal Adjustments on Low Back, back Pain. And it's about outcome research. And we're talking the best solution for back pain. And by the way, that is the funnel into our chiropractic practices. It's back pain. Like it or not, it just is. It also happens to be the number one cause of disability in the planet Earth um, and the number one cause of expenditure of opioids in society. But I want to share with you that on every page you're going to see a QR code. I urge you with the highest level, scan any of those QR codes to get the full research article. And it's housed in the U.S. Chiropractic Directory under the research tab. But I want to share with you, this article was published in the NIH and the National Institute of Health. So it's not just my opinion. It's actually a published article. And everything in that article is based on evidence in the literature. Now, anytime I talk about physical therapy research, it's based upon an article that was published. Um, it, was just, it just came out, and I got an advanced copy of it. And it was published by... Uh, five DPTs, doctors of physical therapy, uh, a couple of PhDs and one chiropractor who actually teaches physical therapy um, uh, in the University of Pittsburgh, and they're also opening a chiropractic college there. So um, it's really a physical therapy derived article. Now, where was the research done or the statistics derived? And by the way, the cohort, which is number of people, usually in a research article, 10, 20, 50, et cetera, the cohort, I believe, is 4,600, give or take a couple of hundred. That's a lot. When I look at the chiropractic cohort, and I give you the chiropractic statistics, it's 6,800. And then we're going to talk about a cohort when I share a statistic with you later that's staggering, which really underscores the issue. But I'd like to read the abstract of the article. And it says opioid use is an indicator of the efficacy of chiropractic care for low back pain. All physical therapy modalities realize uh, no lowering of opiate use, while the addition of active passive care increases up to 90%. So 90% of physical therapy patients increase opi opioid or opiate use with low back pain, which is staggering. So, and what they do is, what's the physical therapy? It's heat, stim, therapeutic exercise, neuromuscular re-education. All of that with um, a, um, uh, a 
physical therapy manipulation. And we talk about that in the article, but we'll talk about that right now. It says, while the addition of active passive care increases opiate use by 90%, and only if you do physical therapy manipulation, which is arthrokinematic or orthokinematic uh, maneuvers or gliding through the facet uh, plane, it does nothing. And if you do anything else, which occurs in 90% of the PT visits, it increases opiate use actually by 80%. Longer physical therapy care increases the use of opiates, spinal injections, MD specialty care, and hospitalizations, including surgeries. Chiropractic care reduces the use of opioids by 55% with a patient satisfaction of 96% while increasing, while decreasing disability by 313% compared to physical therapy. The mechanism is neuroplastic changes with central segmental motor control and chiropractic, high velocity, low amplitude thrust, where a PT manipulation does not affect these changes. We do not manipulate. We don't. We deliver a high velocity thrust. And if you are manipulating, you're feeding into the problem. It doesn't resolve the problem because it doesn't create manipulation, does not create central segmental motor control. Stop using those words interchangeably. It is not a philosophical issue. It has nothing to do with philosophy. It has to do with the evidence in the literature. And if you fo follow the science and the evidence in the literature, you will understand, and, I've, and in this article, I lay it all out. I think there's like 36 or 37 references. It is all laid out, which shows you and explains to you, and it's all there and proven in the scientific arena. Despite the outcomes in the evidence, which I just shared with you, most of our healthcare systems and providers they influence still list physical therapy as the cornerstone of treating low back pain costing hundreds of billions annually. Low back pain is escalating and it is readily available. I'm sorry, low back is escalating and it is considered a worldwide epidemic where an evidence-based cost-effective solution is readily available, but grossly underutilized. There's a prejudice against chiropractic, no matter who we get well, no matter what the scientific arena says, no matter what the patients say, this is not a referendum against physical therapy or medicine, as collaboration with every healthcare discipline is required, and each provider brings a unique skill set to the healthcare marketplace. However, with low back pain, the evidence in the literature strongly suggests that to help eradicate the low back epidemic, uh, low back pain epidemic, and reduce the use and cost of opioids, chiropractic should be the first provider. Now, listen, you're up against big pharma. And they're making actually $1.55 trillion in 1922 on opioids, according to the U.S. Congress uh, Financial Something Something Commission. Okay, $1.55 trillion. Chiropractic will save, it's actually $1.25 trillion, I'm sorry. We lower the cost by 74%, and that's in the literature. It's all evidence. That was a 2018 article. We could actually save our society $750 billion, but they're not going to do it. Well, let me rephrase that. Big Pharma is going to push like crazy. This is their cash cow. You know how many orthopedists own physical therapy centers or they work for them? They're not going to change it. It's going to be a fight, and it's going to be a fight not to the finish, but maybe to the beginning of the solution. Too many people are suffering because you see when we get into it, it's not a referendum against any care. I, there's a time and place for everything. But the question is, where do you begin? Where do you start? What's the most important thing? So when we look at it, it's non-specific back pain. It's the root of the problem. It was disproven in 1895 on a theoretical perspective by, by a guy most of you might have heard of called B.J. Palmer. Again, this is not a philosophical thing. It's not about chest thumping but he was one of the first ones that was that was the year x-ray was invented by uh, andrew rankin in 1895 or william rankin i'm sorry in 1895 same thing bj parman didn't have x-rays he didn't have mris but his theory was so darn close he was correct so in the scientific literature 
um, from the Yale University School of Medicine Department of Orthopedic and Rehabil Rehabilitative Medicine, Panjabi White and Johnson, in 1975, published their first um, article on spinal biomechanics and where the pain is probably coming from or possibly. And then they published again and again and again and again. And if you look today in the genre of spinal biomechanical pathology, there's 16,600 articles in that genre. Somewhere around 2017, 18, a piece of, <clears throat> excuse me, a piece of technology was developed called Simverta. And Simverta actually shows, and let me give you an example. It actually shows where the lesion is coming from. So in this case, it's, there's severe cervical pain with no anatomical pathology and erroneously diagnosed as nonspecific, nonspecific back pain, nonspecific back pain. Where is it? I left it here. No fracture, no tumor, no infection, non-operable dis disc, no advanced arthropathy, which is degeneration. Some erroneous called it arthritis. It's arthropathy, no systemic disease, but it's very specific, but it's called nonspecific back pain. So if medicine can't throw a drug at it and they can't cut it out, they say it's nonspecific. And by the way, you want to know what one of their major solutions is? Psychotherapy, psychotherapy, movement behavior modification. If it hurts like this, don't do it. I'm not joking. I swear it's in the Mayo Clinic's literature today in 2024. Physical therapy is the cornerstone of treating low back pain, which increases opiate use, which is the benchmark for the efficacy of treatment of low back pain, opioid use. Does it help it? Does it hurt it? It doesn't only hurt it, it smashes the, the model and it, it skyrockets it upwards of 90%. That's absurd. But in this particular patient, there is no fracture, tumor, infection, operal um, uh, herniation, et cetera, nothing. But here, there is demonstrative evidence right here at C5. Your blue line is pathology. Ignore the yellow line, uh, their impairment ratings, which have nothing to do with this conversation. But your blue line is pathology. And this is from Severta, which is an evidence-based instrument, which is a measuring device. And it's an analytical device. Here is showing, how do you, this is easy. Even my 11-year-old grandson, I said, Chase, where's the problem? He goes, oh, it's right here, Grandpa. It's the big one. And that it's just so easy because that segment has ligamentous issues. It's got osseous issues and it's causing pain. And we know if the joint is has is, is got pathology and a biomechanical pathology, some of you might call it subluxation. I don't care what you call it, but I'm crossing boundaries into different uh, professions and using terms that everyone can understand to break down barriers to increase utilization. So I'm going to call it biomechanical pathology. So when that joint goes out of position, there, there's a meniscus which displaces. The joint approximates. The nociceptors on the facets are firing. In the joint capsule, which holds it together, which are the ligaments, there's piscinian corpuscles, your stretch receptors, your affinity corpuscles, your crimp receptors. You've got a Golgi tendon apparatus, which also feeds into the lateral horn. And you have more nociceptors in there, which picks up chemical and thermal changes, which feeds into the lateral horn, which then spills over into the deep paraspinal muscles. The first set are your mechanoreceptors, the deep paraspinal muscles, are your proprioceptors. <clears throat> through the, through the, um, through the, I forget the, the name of the ion channels that go back into the lateral horn, up the spinal thalamic tract, through the periaqueductal gray area, ping pongs off different parts of the area, goes efferently down disparate uh, parts of your body to create biomechanical homeostasis. And here is the genesis of it. Here is demonstrably showing where all that's from. And you can have cervical or thoracic pain from low back problems. And you can have lumbar problems from neck, from neck issues and neck pain. So, or from neck pathology. So it's about finding the primary lesion. So we know all of these things and we're able to fix it. Any chiropractic can fix it. I just got real fancy schmancy here and I'm showing you how to identify the primary lesion because there are ways to do that demonstrably. But any chiropractor using biomechanical listings on an x-ray like we learned in chiropractic college. 
Those things give you the similar, not as good, but similar information. So here's your outcomes with physical therapy. Opioid use is increased by 80% if two or more modalities are used, which is 89.89% of the patient or 90%. Modalities such as manual therapy, this is right from the research. Active care, physical activity, passive care, exercise therapy, heat, needle therapy, acupuncture, dry needling, therapeutic exercise, neuromuscular rehab, ultrasound, mechanical traction, and e-step. It's just what everyone does in physical therapy, and it increases that. If you do no opioid, if you do um, only manipulation, it doesn't reduce it at all. It stays flat. Nothing. It does zero. Spinal injections increase by 32% if any one modality is used. Spinal injection, in, injections increase by 53% if any two or more modalities are used. MD specialty care, including hospitalizations, go up by 27% with one modality and by 50% of two or more modalities are used. And that's the reference, folks, right here. Here's your reference. But scan the QR code. It'll bring you right to the article. It's free. zippity doo -dah. It costs you nothing. I never hide research behind firewalls or, or pay, thing, pay portals. It's all yours. Conversely, Chiropractic, opioid use decreases by 55% with chiropractic care. It decreases by 56% with chiropractic care in the elderly. Opioid prescriptions decreased by 54% for over a year following chiropractic. Prescription costs decreased by 74%. Here's your reference, 2018, disability, 2017. With chiropractic care, opioid use decreases by 313% versus physical therapy and decreases by 239% uh, for primary disability with chiropractic care. Your cohort here is 5,511 patients. Here's my favorite one. Nitedon, Nidetan, God, I can't pronounce it. Nidetan in 2020 found that 96% of patients are satisfied with chiropractic care, including back pain. You want to know what the cohort was, folks? 8,023,000 patients. It was a four month study nationally. 8 million was the cohort and almost everybody got better. Almost everybody. It's just an overwhelming statistic. Again, why doesn't everyone shout this for them? Why doesn't every provider feed and listen? If I had cancer, I wouldn't go to a chiropractor. You know, I'd, I'd want someone who treats cancer who can help cure me. And, and, and people do get cured. By the way, um, and, and I don't care how you, you're doing it, but by the same token, if you've got back pain, which is only a little piece of what we do, why wouldn't they, well, you want them to send them to us? And by the way, pain is the funnel into your chiropractic practices. When I first opened up, I had an old mimeograph machine. I mean, I could smell the ink. And I used to mimeograph flyers, fold them. I got a, a mailing list that I hand wrote things and I mailed them. And um, it was about well, about wellness and staying well and I'm gonna adjust you and you know, and 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 a, a lot of a lot of, you know, all the philosophical things perhaps I grew up with. And I got a call from someone in my neighborhood, and I live close to New York City in the suburbs. And this woman said, Dr. Student, I work on Madison Avenue, the marketing capital of the world. And you seem like a nice young man. I know you've just opened up, but I want to share two things with you. A little unsolicited advice. Number one, your flyer is very unprofessional. It was printed on a mimeograph machine. It wasn't professionally done. And it looks like crap, but it appears that your reputation might be that look, crap. So I said, I appreciate it. Secondly, she said, in healthcare, here's what we've learned on Madison Avenue. People are motivated by two things to see a doctor, pain and fear. That's it. Pain and fear. It don't hurt. I ain't going anywhere. Do I want to stay well? Oh, absolutely. That usually happens when you get to be my age. I'm 68. Oh, my God. You know, all of a sudden things are starting to hurt. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going to start eating well. I don't smoke, but if I did, oh my God, I'm going to stop now. I don't drink, but if I did, I'd say, my God, maybe I should stop now. Too late, folks. Just want to share that with you. However, 
the majority of patients are motivated by pain and fear. So if half our society, and it's actually 34% of, of the global population at any given time is suffering from back or neck pain. That's a lot of people. That's a huge amount of people. So if that's the case, you've got a large audience to, to reach out to. Once you get them in your office, you have an opportunity to educate them on anything you want. Nutrition, exercise, wellness, mental attitude. You can do whatever you want when they're in your, in your office, provided it's within your lawful scope. And don't let anyone stop you. But this is your funnel from getting them in. Now, the other thing when we're dealing with medical providers or even lawyers is credentials. Okay, it's credentials. And I want to let you know that in the Academy of Chiropractic, one of the things that we really focus on is credentials. So we have a relationship with Cleveland University, Kansas City College of Chiropractic, which is our uh, CE uh, partner. We get all our chiropractic CE credits through them. Actually, that's not true. We get some through the Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Boards, which every state should be a part of. Um, uh, and we work through a, a myriad of other things. So we're accredited in every state for, for courses. But we also have our courses accredited through the State University of New York at Buffalo, Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Now, I happen to become uh, a professor in, that, in the medical school in the Department of Family Medicine. Um, part of that reason is I wanted an entree for publishing, and which is why the article which this link brings you to, and I urge you to click on that link to get this article. Um, it, it's just a, a cleaner pathway to get published, and it's working. It's just working. We're getting published in the NIH on a regular basis now, and that's fantastic. But I want to share with you, if I was on one Main Street, in downtown um, uh, Salem, Oregon, or Tampa, Florida, or Birmingham, Alabama, and, and, and you were on two Main Street in those same communities, and someone went to you and said, where were you trained? You have all these statistics, all this information. Oh, I was trained at Life Chiropractic College. I was trained at North at National uh, University. I was trained at... Um, at a Northeastern Chiropractic College or Northeastern University. And, and, that, and that, well, that's very impressive. Then they come to me and say, where were you trained? I was trained through the State University of New York at Stony Brook Jacobs School of Medicine. Who are they going to go to? They're coming to me, folks, because I've now made you irrelevant. And it's the same course. It's the same information. It's the same, same professors. It's the same everything. But perception drives reality. And you don't have to like it. I don't have to like it. But there is a prejudice towards medical doctors versus chiropractors, just like there should be a prejudice versus chiropractors uh, um, on top of physical therapists. Unfortunately, we come out short because big pharma and organized medicine loses money from us. But we're going to keep fighting that fight and ensure we're in front of their face. But when you start sharing your academic credentials on the medical side, that you've been trained uh, through graduate medical education postdoctorally, all of a sudden your reputation just changed. Like it or not, I don't like it. I don't think it's fair. It's reality. But guess what happens? The floodgates open up. I have doctors now getting 100 to 140 new cases a month, having a, a six-week wait just to get into their office purely predicated on their credentials. And it just works. It just works. I have one doctor who if shared with me uh, just, uh, just recently that in the past five years, one orthopedic group with nine orthos referred him 1,500 cases just based on his credentials and resultant knowledge base. That's it. And it goes on and on and on and on around the country. It works, it works, it works. So this is what's going on in the industry. This is what's happening. This is what you can be a part of. So folks, listen, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to share this time with you. I'm Dr. Mark Student. And again, thank you, Cairo Secure, for allowing me to bring this to you. And I look forward for our next chapter.